So welcome to this Beaver webinar. eBeaver is sponsored by Zoetis, and Zoetis was created on the back of 60 year experience of Pfizer Animal Health. It discovers, develops, manufactures, markets veterinary um, vaccines and medicines, and it has a truly global presence. This webinar is going to be given by Dr. Richard Newton, who is Head of Epidemiology and Disease Surveillance at the Animal Health Trust Newmarket. His topic is biosecurity and the webinar is sponsored by the Horse Race Betting Levy Board in order to highlight the importance of biosecurity on equine premises. And we've done this to mark the launch of the EquiBioSafe app, which Richard will tell you more about. But it is based on the HBLB codes and the NTF codes. Both of these are aimed at the thoroughbred, but by bringing together the information they contain, we hope that this will be a really useful free resource for all horse owners. Richard. Thank you very much, Celia. Today, I'm going to talk, you, talk to you about infectious disease prevention and control, in particular looking at effective strategies for equine premises. This is a broad-ranging um, presentation aimed at horse owners, and particularly those owners that take their animals and go to events and make use of them. So to give you a broad overview, I'm going to cover some general principles which really is only common sense, but it's worthy of uh, reminding everybody about them. I'm then going to look at understanding the basics of what I call the enemies that are endemic diseases, those diseases that we can't get rid of and we have to live with. I'm going to compare and contrast three of these, influenza, strangles and herpes virus. I'm then going to look at some practical steps to reduce the risk of infectious diseases, starting at home, where animals reside most of the time, but importantly, whilst attending an event. We know that people like to use their horses for different activities and they take them around the country for that. But also, importantly, after returning home from an event when there may be a heightened risk of introducing infectious disease. And finally, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about EquiBioSafe, the new app that the Levy Board have sponsored and is going to be there to help us all. So what about general principles? Well, hopefully everybody can buy into the concept that prevention is better than cure. To think of vaccines and quarantine as insurance policies, not something that is just an expense for no good reason. I think it's important to understand what you are dealing with, what are the enemies, and important to note that they're not all the same. Not all infectious diseases behave in the same way. Simple routine clinical recording can be a terribly valuable tool, knowing what is normal within your horses and when something is different and starting to go wrong. Taking early action can pay very big dividends. Seeking veterinary assistance and expertise. And don't be afraid to take samples and conduct laboratory tests to work out what is causing the problem. Because that early diagnosis can help in control and ultimately in returning to a disease-free state. Whilst you're away from home with your horse, it's a good concept to keep yourself to yourself while you're away from home. Reduce that risk of introducing infection. And finally, it's good to act responsibly. Do unto others as you would want to be done to yourself. So, I'd like you to consider this concept, that effective control of a disease within a given population is easier when you have a thorough understanding of the way that that disease behaves in that setting. And if you do that, then you're understanding the epidemiology of the disease. So what do I mean by this? What factors are we looking at? It's important to understand what the potential sources of an infection can be. What are the routes by which it can be introduced? Do we need to consider the silent carrier or the latent infections, the animals that may not look overtly ill, but can act as a source of infection. How are we going to diagnose these? Are these diagnoses always accurate? How do we enhance our possibility of getting an accurate diagnosis? What about biosecurity and hygiene? What can we do routinely to reduce the risk that infections can transmit should they arise? And if we do have an infection, what are the prospects that we can eradicate it from the population where our horse is and return us to a disease-free state? 
And do we need to be thinking about prevention? And in that, obviously, vaccination can be a very important factor. So I'm now going to just consider the three infections that I talked about. Firstly, equine influenza. This is a highly contagious, rapidly spreading viral respiratory disease of horses. The importance with this infection is that it relies on chains of infectious spread to persist within horses. So in other words, there is no carrier or latent state for this infection. We don't have silent carriers of the virus that are in the population and can reproduce the infection at any time. So that being the case, frequent moving and mixing of horses in the absence of vaccination is absolutely ideal for the spread of equine influenza. So inevitably, we do find that equine flu mainly affects non-vaccinated horses. But importantly, it can occur in animals that are vaccinated. And please be assured, vaccines do work, but they do periodically need to be updated. And doing surveillance and understanding that is an important part of the work that we do. So this slide here just takes you through the process of when a healthy susceptible animal meets an infection, it goes through a very short period of time where it doesn't have signs and is not infectious, but after a few days the horse starts to develop signs, coughing, nasal discharge, raised temperature and being off food. At this time the horse starts to become infectious and shed virus, which it will do for up to maybe 10 days at absolute maximum. Then as the immune system of the horse kicks in, it will return to health and it will become immune against that infection. So what does vaccination do? Well in that, we want to be able to take our healthy susceptible horse and move it without signs of disease or being infectious to a healthy immune animal. And in that way, vaccination can really help us in breaking those chains of transmission. And here we see those chains of transmission, starting with one horse, spreading it onto another, the next horse then spreads it onto another, and so on and so on. Those chains can be broken, and many times we think that's what happens. So not all infectious horses will necessarily spread it onto the next one. Moving on to strangles, caused by the bacteria Streptococcus equi. This again is a contagious bacterial disease of horses. Endemic strangles, i.e. strangles that is never completely got rid of from a premises, such as on studs, can occur due to subclinical carriers. They're a regular source of infection to young stock particularly, and if you've got no plan of dealing with that, that's when you can get into problems. But strangles can be eliminated from premises, but it does take a plan, it takes time, it takes effort, and it takes expense. And you do need to adopt laboratory testing, blood tests, agent detection, in order to be able to eliminate this infection from premises. And we will see that strangles can be prevented from coming onto premises, but people do need continu continuous vigilance in order to achieve that. So in a similar way that we saw with flu, we see a dynamic of Streptococcus equi infection. Healthy susceptible animals meet the organism. They go through a slightly longer incubation period before they develop signs. They become infectious before those signs appear, and therefore we have a period in which of higher risk in which animals without signs can act as a source of infection. The signs for strangles are pretty dramatic. We see lymph node abscesses, we see pus appearing from the nose and out of the, those abscessated lymph nodes, and they, they're pretty uh, easily identified at that stage. Those animals will recover and will return to health, but we see that there is a period, perhaps of several weeks, where they can still be harboring the organism, they can still be infectious after those signs have disappeared. And that obviously is a high risk period if those animals start moving around. But the secret of strangle success actually lies in 
around 10% of affected animals becoming long-term carriers. So they will continue to harbour that organism for months or even years and can act as a source of infection even after they've returned to normal health. So, healthy carriers are the most important factor in the way that strangles is able to persist within the horse population. But we have shown that control measures can effectively eliminate and prevent strangles from entering premises. By identifying and treating carriers after outbreaks, this will break this cycle of ongoing infection. Use of quarantine and screening of high-risk animals for subclinical carriage of this organism again can be effective in preventing the introduction of the disease. It's unlikely at the moment that eradication by vaccination alone is going to be effective. Future vaccines that are able to differentiate infected animals from those that are vaccinated will help in this regard, but those vaccines are not yet available. So in this example, I just want to talk you through the way that a strangles outbreak can be effectively managed. We have groups of animals, as you see here, that have clinical signs of strangles. They need to be isolated away from other animals on the premises. They're in the red zone. We also have an amber zone, which are animals that have been in contact with the cases, but have not developed signs. They have no signs of strangles at the moment. And then we have a green group and they again are isolated away from these two groups. These animals have no clinical signs and they've not had contact with either of the other groups. It's important in this regard that when we're dealing with these outbreaks that we move between these groups in a sensible manner. And in this we want to move from the green low risk group to the amber group so that the risk of transmission back to the green group is absolutely minimized. And similarly we want to move from the amber group to the red group in that order so we're not risking the introduction of disease going the other way. It's really important as designated here by the color coded buckets that you appear that all equipment and feed and water uh, utensils are clearly kept within these groups and are not transferred because they can act as sources of infection. It's also important to clinically monitor these animals for a period of time because they may be incubating the infection, they may yet develop signs. And when a fever is detected, which is the first sign of strangles, we need to be prepared to move the animal from the amber group, for example, to the red group so that it doesn't do any more damage within that amber group. We can then conduct blood tests to see what the exposure status is within the amber and green groups, and that again can be useful to highlight animals that may be harbouring this infection that we don't know about, the so-called carriers. We then have to screen the animals in the red group to see if they're harbouring this infection, which can happen within their guttural pouches. This will require these animals to be uh, endoscoped, uh, samples collected, and those submitted to the laboratory for testing. And any animals that have come up with suspicious blood tests, they similarly should be screened because you could have silent carriers sitting within these other two groups. And it's important to identify them and treat them appropriately. So moving on to equine herpes virus. This is different again. This can act as a, a cause of respiratory disease, it can cause abortion in pregnant mares, and it also has the ability to cause neurological disease in adult animals. Unfortunately, most horses are latently infected with this virus, and by latent, we mean that they're not always infectious. They're harboring a silent form of the virus, but they're not uh, infectious to other horses all of the time. But importantly, they do have the potential to become infectious particularly if they become stressed and this virus re-emerges. It's really important with cases of EHV1 that appropriate management of the first cases, the index cases, if they're appropriately managed, then major problems can be prevented. And this is a major theme of the codes of practice, which I'll refer to later. Mismanagement of these index cases can spell disaster. 
multiple abortions, large-scale neurological disease outbreaks. And unfortunately, with this virus, disaster may strike even if good management has been put in place because a bad set of circumstances have occurred. So these are the three syndromes, respiratory disease, uh, late-term abortion and neurological disease. The secret of EHV1's success is that there are generational cycles of infection. This moves from adult horses into the next generation uh, in the early months of life and because it has the ability to create latent infection that then allow it to persist lifelong within that horse. So most healthy horses are latently infected unfortunately with this virus. For triggers that are not completely understood but stress is believed to be a factor, this virus can reactivate and we get this disease re-emerging periodically. And that can present as abortion or neurological disease or, or respiratory disease. So the important message is that EHV1 can only be managed. We can't eradicate this from the horse population. We have to deal with it when it occurs and we have to deal with it responsibly. The disease due to EHV1 may spontaneously occur once this latent virus reactivates. Unfortunately, it has the ability to produce significant outbreaks of disease and even death. And this carries associated financial and welfare consequences. We're still seeing the very occasional abortion storm, which can affect multiple mares. And we're seeing that in the UK in 2016 at the moment. Large neurological outbreaks can occur. We saw this in the UK in 2012 and 2013 and particularly in the USA in the years since then. It can affect horses attending all types of events and on all types of premises. Viral latency is widespread and very difficult to control. And unfortunately, vaccination is currently not optimal for this infection. And therefore, we have to handle these outbreaks in a very responsible way. So what about practical steps? Well, what I want to cover here are the steps to reduce the risk of acquiring and spreading infections. And just to reiterate, I'm going to talk about this at home, whilst attending an event, and probably most importantly, after returning home from an event when a disease transmission event may have occurred. Events can be important because infections that one horse carries there can then be spread far and wide and, and that can happen very quickly. So whilst at home, I believe it is a very good practice to take rectal temperatures routinely and to record these in a diary for each animal. Build up a picture of what is normal for each animal and then when the abnormal happens and the horse spikes a temperature, you become aware of it straight away. Spiking of temperature is an early sign of infectious disease. It's not specific to any one disease, but in many infections, it is the first sign that is detected. When that happens, it's good practice to promptly isolate those animals away from others in a predetermined area that's designed for that purpose. And at the same time, request a veterinary clinical examination. Call the vet out to look at the horse to see what may be going on. And this is particularly important where perhaps more than one animal um, are spiking temperatures in close proximity to each other, suggestive that an infectious disease may be present and may be spreading amongst them. So the vet will come out, he will uh, conduct a clinical examination. He may suspect an infectious disease, particularly if other signs are then identified on that clinical examination. If there's a cough, a nasal discharge, if the horse is slightly wobbly on, on its back legs, would all be suspicious signs that something is going, or going wrong. The vet may suggest that taking of samples for laboratory testing will help to rule in or rule out diagnoses. And whilst there's a cost to this, it can be very useful to do this to get an early indication of what the causative agent is. And once you know that, then this will inform the most appropriate management of that case and other animals on the premises. It's really important not to move animals from affected premises where infectious diseases have been diagnosed, because obviously that can spread the infection and the problem uh, 
can soon become bigger than just the one premises affected. It's important to remember that outwardly, animals may be incubating infections. Outwardly healthy animals may be in incubating infections. So moving apparently healthy animals can cause problems too. So whilst at home, it's still good to observe practical and effective hygiene and biosecurity at all times. Think about what is good practice. Use of disinfectants, boot dips, hand wipes, not moving between animals without some sort of protection and disinfection. Do take care with visitors, especially those that may have contact with horses on other premises and that may act to bring in infections. It's very useful periodically to risk assess the use of vaccination and whether this should be being used in the circumstances that you find yourself across a range of diseases. And I'll cover what vaccines we have available here in the UK. And finally, do consider the use of quarantine for animals that are coming onto the premises for the first time and perhaps may well be staying. And Within that, obviously, the application of screening laboratory tests in order to inform what may be being brought in with those animals. So looking at vaccines, we have eight vaccines available, uh, or eight diseases for which we have vaccines available for horses in the UK. The first of these is tetanus. This is a fatal disease, and all horses should be considered for this, um, for this vaccination. Influenza. This is particularly important for horses that are moving and mixing and going to events. Some events, such as those uh, at racing, um, will have mandatory vaccination policies that must be followed before entry into racehorse stables. But it's good practice, even if events don't have compulsory vaccination policies, to take that responsibility yourself and vaccinate your horses. To stop animals that have been to events bringing this infection back and infecting the rest of the animals on, on your premises. EHV1 and EHV4, especially important in pregnant mares, but this can be extended to many other types of animals as well, including young stock, which can act as a source of infection for other horses. Strangles, there is a vaccine available here. Um, but probably only really for use in the face of endemic infection. This vaccine at the moment does not have DIVA capability and will um, obscure the use of um, the tests that we have for detecting the organism and detecting the uh, immune response. Equine viral, viral arteritis, a venereal viral disease of horses, really only used in breeding stallions and, uh, and, and teasers used alongside them. West Nile virus. We don't have West Nile virus in the UK, but it is worth considering the, the use of this vaccine for animals traveling to affected areas, which includes the US, it includes parts of Europe and beyond. Rotavirus. This is used for foaling mares, particularly on affected farms, to protect the foals that they then give birth to. And finally, Lawsonia. For use in foals on affected farms, several months old, should be said this is a pig vaccine that would need to be um, special permission to be used in horses. But it is being used and it is being shown to be effective on affected farms. So I now just want to give you an example of the use of quarantine and how it can help prevent the introduction of disease. And in this example, I'm going to use strangles. So we have groups of horses that are waiting to come onto a premises. We place them into a quarantine area on the farm and we're going to keep them there for three to four weeks whilst we're able to observe them clinically and do several tests on them. When they first arrive, we want to conduct a blood test looking to see if they've been exposed to the strangles organism, Streptococcus equi. If those animals test negative on the first sample, then we look two weeks later to test them again, and if they remain negative, then we consider that they're safe to enter the herd because they've got no indication that they've been exposed to strangles and are highly unlikely to be harboring the organism and then introducing it onto the farm. D. 
different matter if they come back positive on the first blood test. We need to investigate this further. That blood test is just telling us that they've got antibodies against the organism. They may not be harboring it, but we can't take that risk. So in this, we do further tests, we scope their guttural pouches, we take nasopharyngeal swabs, and we conduct a highly sensitive test called PCR. If they're negative, then they're safe to enter the herd, but if they're positive, then we've averted a disaster because we've detected these animals that are carrying the organism. So we treat them and we retest them and we put them back through the cycle where we have to determine that they're not harboring the organism. So, just one slide about whilst we're at an event. This animal here is wrapped in bubble wrap, we're trying to protect our animal while it's away from home as much as possible. And essentially, it's a matter of keeping yourself to yourself. Avoid direct contact between horses that can act as a source of infection. Also think about indirect contact, sharing of water sources, equipment, again, that can act as a potential source of infection. Don't share equipment that can act as a fomite, can act to harbour and transfer infection. And also think about good hygiene practices and use of personal protective equipment. So, after returning home from an event, I think it is important to think about some form of quarantine for horses returning from events to try and avoid the introduction of infectious agents. Quarantine is the isolation of animals that are potentially incubating infections. We use the term isolation once those animals are showing signs. We isolate affected animals. So quarantine is specific really to healthy animals that we co are concerned may be harboring uh, infections. Ideally, you would want to adopt this for periods of at least two to three weeks to allow the manifestation of clinical disease in those animals uh, if they acquired it at that event. Essentially, if you apply shorter quarantine, and you don't observe good biosecurity, then you are increasing the risk of introducing infections acquired at events back into your resident horses. So, maximising the quarantine and thinking about the biosecurity that you put around those horses, again, can pay dividends and prevent major outbreaks. So what does an effective quarantine look like? Well, it will involve some form of physical separation of those quarantined horses away from the rest of the population. Once you get towards beyond 10 and 20 metres separation, then that is sufficient distance to stop the transfer of most infections through the air. And it is possible to adapt existing arrangements for this, to use end boxes at the end of a row, using empty boxes in between. You can very quickly come up with a good quarantine system. Ideally, you would want to use separate dedicated staff to look after those animals and avoid the risk of transfer from them to the resident horses. Similarly, with dedicated equipment for the same reason. If that's not possible, then think about dealing with the horses in quarantine after the resident horses to avoid that transfer of infection from the quarantine to the resident horses. Again, taking routine temperatures, noting any clinical signs that are seen in a diary is an important step. That little bit of time to do that will highlight if a problem is starting to arise. Request veterinary examination of animals in quarantine if those clinical signs start to appear. So you're looking out for the fever, the raised temperature, the nasal discharge, the coughing, the incoordination, and abortion, obviously, if it occurs. Undertake sampling and laboratory testing. Taking of swabs, using PCR to look for infectious agents. Taking blood samples several weeks apart to look for rising antibodies that would indicate that a horse has been infected and its immune response has been triggered. And also, if you think that you've had a horse go to an event and it's acquired an infection, Important to notify the event organisers. You may, may not be the only one, and tracing and um, getting on top of uh, these infections arising from these events 
can be really important in minimising the extent of these outbreaks. We have various sources of information that you can make use of and these are all the concepts that I've talked about are promoted through various initiatives and I just include four here. One produced by the BHS in Scotland, Strategy to Eradicate and Prevent Strangles, STEPS, deals specifically with strangles and takes you through all of the, the um, matters that I've talked about. The National Trainers Federation has a code of practice for infectious diseases of racehorses in training, an online resource, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. A group of vets called XL Equine produced a guide to preventing equine contagious diseases called Plan, Prevent and Protect. A lot of good common sense um, things in that, and again it's available online. And last but by no means least, because it's well over 30 years old, the Horse Race Betting Levy Board codes of practice that um, are designed to deal with the infectious diseases that can appear on uh, breeding premises and deals with venereal diseases and other diseases as well. So I mentioned the NTF code, I mentioned the HBLB code. Well now they're being brought together by the Levy Board into uh, a new app that is available and this is called Equi Biosafe. This is a really exciting project because it brings together a number of um, important uh, matters with infectious disease and it's got scope to expand in the future as well. So this is a new app that has been adapted from the HBLB codes of practice, the NTF codes of practice and as well as that it has some special unique features as well. The local animal health officers of the Animal and Plant Health Agency. You're able to find that through the, the, the um, GPS function on, on the mobile device. You're able to check the contagious equine metritis uh, risk status of any particular animal through a series of questions. And also the Jockey Club rules for equine influenza vaccination. You're able to use this app in order to check uh, where you are in terms of that using the calculator on the app. So these are some screenshots that have been taken from EquiBioSafe. You'll see this opening um, screen here takes you through options of biosecurity, breeding stock, racehorses and other horses and this is an area that will expand in time. If you choose the breeding stock that will take you into the HBLB codes of practice and be before very long you're into individual diseases such as contagious equine metritis and then that will take you through the different sections that we see in the code all from the convenience of your mobile device. There will be video and image uh, libraries available to help people through um, the conduct of laboratory of um, sampling of horses for example, clinical signs that appear what features we have of diseases such as coital xanthema, strangles, etc. The special features, as I say, will include a GPS location so that you're able to identify your local animal health office so that in the event that you have a notifiable disease that you're able to, um, in accordance with the law, notify that or your vet is able to notify that to them as quickly as possible. This is the window from the stallion risk status. I'll just ask you a series of questions and then we'll tell you what the status of your animal is. And depending on that status, we'll take you through uh, the testing that is required to demonstrate that the animal is clear of infection. And finally, the vaccine calculator where you can enter dates of uh, particular vaccinations and it will tell you the dates on which the next vaccination is due. And that's really important if you're taking horses to events where vaccine rules are, will apply and passports will be inspected. So, finally, I just want to conclude. It's really important that common sense is applied and if you do that, you won't be going far wrong. The three diseases that I touched on, influenza, it can be prevented, well, most of the time. So do consider use of vaccination. 
Strangles similarly can be prevented and it can be eradicated if it occurs. It's not the scourge that people think it is if it's managed properly. EHV1 is endemic. We are not going to eradicate it. It needs to be managed responsibly and people need to be aware of what they need to do when this disease occurs. Making disease prevention part of your routine can work. Consider vaccines and quarantine as insurance policies and invest in them. And do be prepared to take early action and always act responsibly. And finally, please look out for EquiBioSafe. It's there and it will help you. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much for that really common sense and comprehensive um, outline of biosecurity. You focused naturally on endemic disease, but I just wondered if you would have some time to touch on exotic disease in particular. What advice would you give to people who are travelling horses back from abroad? Yeah, um, I didn't really have time to touch on exotic disease, but it's clearly it's a grow, of growing importance and people do need to be aware of it. I touched on the West Nile va vaccine virus. Mm -hmm. Each year I get asked about what, what, which horses travelling abroad should use that. And that's an example. Similarly, buying horses from the continent, we know that equine infectious anemia is present there and it is a risk. So making testing of horses for these diseases part of the pre-purchase contract, if you like, I think mm -hmm. is really important. Test these animals before you bring them in. EVA is common in mainland Europe. They don't consider it the same as we do. So you could buy a horse that they don't consider to be um, affected and a simple test would identify that the stallion that you're about to buy could be a high risk for EVA. Okay. And um, like you, I'm very excited about the EquiBioSafe app. I'm very pleased with the content as it is, but you did uh, mention about, uh, that there's a possibility for future expansion. Which areas do you think we should work on next in the EquiBioSafe project? Well, I think there's a glaring omission in there at the moment, and that's all of the diseases that we deal with with foals. The HBLB code deals with stallions and breeding mares mm -hmm. and takes animals up to the point of their early life. But it then sort of abandons them and we don't see what happens. And those foals are vulnerable, they, undertake, they, they can succumb to a number of conditions and mm -hmm. I think that's an area that really needs to be included um, to take those animals and, and make sure that people are able to manage and control mm -hmm. those infections really well. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the beauties of that sort of whole app concept is it's very quick to we very quick and easy to send out upgrades, isn't it? So there's yeah. lots of potential for the future, isn't there? I think there is, and another area that we've touched on would be the exotic disease. So mm -hmm. if the situation changes and the risk heightens for our country or a part of it, then the upgrades can can be put out very quickly and alert sent, and people using that app are going to be amongst the first people to hear about it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Richard. Thank you.